So you'd worked with Jack Nicholson early in his career on Little Shop and The Terror. Give us the first moment when you knew he was going to be the star he became. Uh, I had enrolled in an acting class uh, when I was first starting to direct. My degree in college was in engineering, and I felt I learned the technical aspects of directing well, but not enough about acting. And I met Jack in the acting class, and watching him for just the first few sessions, uh, it was clear to me that he was a brilliant actor. Now, at first I said, here's the best actor in the class, and then I thought, he's not only the best actor in the class, this is a brilliant actor. He's going to have a major career. So can you describe Dick Miller in one sentence? Intensely funny. <laughs> okay. so. You had a hand in the early careers of so many Hollywood giants, Francis Ford Coppola, Ron Howard, Martin Scorsese, James Cameron, Joe Dante, Jonathan Demme, Nicholson. When you take a step back from your career and their careers, do you feel like a proud father a little bit? Yes, I do feel either like a proud father or the proud uh, teacher at a school. Uh, we think of them as our graduates. <laughs> And uh, Coppola put you in Godfather 2 and then Demi, Silence of the Lambs. How did those castings come to be, and were you receptive or reluctant to accept them? I, actually, I thought it was funny. when uh, The first <laughs> one was Francis, who asked me to be, what was I? I was, I was uh, uh, the junior senator on the Senate Crime Investigating Committee. Mm -hmm. And I said, he said, it'll be just a couple of days. And I said, it'll be fun. I, uh, I'd be happy to do it. And uh, that seemed to go reasonably well. And I've forgotten who I did it for later. I did it for uh, Francis, for Ron Howard, for uh, Jonathan Demme a few times, mm -hmm. for Joe Dante. Uh, a couple of others. Mm -hmm. So what was the single greatest aspect of American international pictures? Probably the fact that they stood back and let you make the picture as you wished. All they wanted to know generally was the subject matter. Uh, it was the freest uh, of working conditions I've ever encountered. And what's the most unique and meaningful gift that you've ever received? Uh, now, I've answered all the questions quickly. This one, I'm <laughs> not. Uh, I'm not certain. Uh, uh, oh, my son, my two sons, a number of years ago. I've always driven sports cars. I uh, went to the Los Angeles uh, Auto Show, and it was the first showing of the new Mercedes uh, sports car at the time, and the Mercedes was the hit of the show. And so they bought me one, and I thought, this is really nice of these guys. They bought hmm. me this really expensive Mercedes, and I thought, wait a minute, it is expensive. They don't have any money. <laughs> turned out my wife paid for it. <laughs> Uh, and when was the last, or excuse, actually, I was going to say, when was the first time you realized you had the power to do something meaningful, and what did that turn out to be in terms of your career? I think it was probably when I became a director. I started as a writer, then became a writer-producer, and then became a producer-director. And uh, it wasn't until the second or third day of working as a director that I realized the potential of what could be done as a director. The first couple of days, I was really nervous. Uh, but by, the, I guess, the third day, I started getting over that and began to enjoy it and realize the potential. Mm -hmm. Now, I've read often that you said no film you ever made turned out exactly as you saw it in your mind, but what's the biggest regret looking back on your career? I mean, what's the one film maybe you thought was going to be something a little bit different than it turned out to be? Well, the film turned out all right. I made a picture in, I think it was about 1960, called The Intruder about racial integration mm -hmm. in the American South with a new actor who had just come out from New York, Bill Shatner, playing the lead. Mm -hmm. The picture went to the Venice Film Festival, didn't win but got good reviews, won a couple of small festivals, got wonderful reviews. One of the uh, New York papers, I can still remember the review, I, I said, this motion picture is a major credit to the entire American film industry. It was the first film I ever made that lost money. <laughs> Still a very successful film in its own right, though. Um, 
So what was the single most interesting conversation you've had with John Bloom, otherwise known as Joe Bob Briggs, who took your cue and gave us blood, breasts, and beasts of drive-in totals? Right. Well, I wouldn't say there was any one conversation. He was a very bright guy. I mm-hmm. think he had several degrees in English literature and had been a, uh, an English professor at one time. And he was very intelligent and very funny. And the main thing I remember is the fact that he was both. He was very funny and uh, he was very intelligent. And he was just having fun making, uh, making fun of uh, these films. <laughs> You executive produced a Fantastic Four film back in 1994 before the boom of superhero movies. Since that influx, though, which has been the superhero flick that you've enjoyed most and why? Uh, about I've forgotten when it came out, a year or so ago. I thought Guardians of the Galaxy hmm. was very good because they brought humor into it. When you really think about it, you can't take these things seriously. <laughs> right. Maybe a, a teen or sub-teenage boy can. But uh, essentially, if you're an adult or semi-adult, you have to realize that this stuff is insane. (laughs) Guardians of the Galaxy did it with humor, Mm -hmm. and I thought that really is the way these should be done. So what is something or someone you miss from childhood? Hmm. That's kind of a tough one. That is a tough one. It goes back a long, a long time. Um, a friend of mine uh, who uh, actually went to, went on and to go to college with me uh, joined the CIA, and he was found dead in his stateroom on the Queen Mary, oh, and right. none of us ever knew the circumstances of what happened. We assumed, of course, it had something to do with the CIA. Hmm. And now... Uh, Well, that's going to lead into the next one. What's the hardest thing you've ever had to do? Probably it would go back to my first day as a director. Getting through that first day was probably the toughest thing I ever had to do. And what about that was the most difficult? The fact that I hadn't realized the burden or pressure that the decisions I was making were irreversible. If I said print on a shot and went on to the next one, that shot was there unless I went back and I then redid it on my schedule. I shot the picture, I think, in nine days or something like mm-hmm. that. Uh, there was no time to go back. So the realization that each decision I made stood forever as long as, long as that film existed. And what's the best advice you were ever given? I actually don't know. I've been given so much advice, I can't remember. (laughs) I'll have to pass on that one. (laughs) (laughs) All right. In horror still today, the icons are Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers, Freddy Krueger. Do you think Bela Lugosi, Boris Karloff, Vincent Price, Lon Chaney, do they get the recognition and respect they deserve for their contribution to the genre? I think they got the recognition. I don't know if they got the respect. I think they've gotten the respect posthumously. At that time, people took horror less seriously than they did today, not that it's taken, uh, are considered to be a full art form, but it's considered to be, uh, as a matter of fact, I remember talking with Vincent one time, Vincent Price, Mm -hmm. and he said, what we're doing, we're craftsmen. We're not artists, we're craftsmen. We're like somebody working on a medieval cathedral carving stone. We have a job to do that is creative. And if the best we do, if we do it well, we're craftsmen. And if occasionally it it rises to the level of art, that's wonderful. But we're craftsmen. I'm not certain that's an exact answer to the question, but it's Mm -hmm. vaguely there. (laughs) And then finally... For somebody who's been involved in the making of as many films as you have and seen as many films as you surely have, what was the last movie you saw that moved you to tears? I I have not been moved to tears uh, uh, by a movie for a long, long time. The problem is sometimes if a film does get too sentimental or too emotional, I start thinking about how the shot 
was laid out, what the cutting process was, and so forth, and I sort of automatically stepped back from becoming overly emotional in a film. All right. All right. Makes sense. Well, Mr. Corman, I really appreciate you taking some time to talk with us. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye.